Good afternoon and welcome to today's program, Fertile Ground in Illinois Infrastructure Outlook and Tax Update. My name is Todd Dotson, the Executive Director of the Tri-Council Development Fund. Today's program is presented by the Tri-Council Development Fund. The TCDF is a collaboration of labor management organizations within the Illinois finishing trades. The TCDF utilizes our collective leadership, advocacy, training, and other resources to help build community wealth and promote prosperity for all. As a community-focused initiative, the TCDF partners with municipal governments, community-based organizations, and other stakeholders on projects that strengthen communities, promote economic justice, and catalyze inclusive growth. Our primary areas of focus include infrastructure resilience, workforce development, economic opportunity, and housing balance. You can learn more at our website, tcdfillinois.org. Today's program is sponsored by the Corrosion Illinois Network, a network developed with the specific purpose of creating a forum for people and organizations engaged in protecting Illinois state and local infrastructure assets. The Corrosion Illinois Network is a project of the Tri-Council Development Fund. Today's sponsors also include Finishing Chicago, your one-stop shop for identifying qualified contractors for all of your finishing needs in Chicago, and Bit Evolution, the exclusive source for finding the perfect bit painting and drywall contractor in Northern and Central Illinois. Finally, a very special thank you to our promotional sponsor, the Ely Chapter of Lambda Alpha International, the Global Honorary Society for the Advancement of Land Economics. Next, I would like to introduce today's moderator, Zach Lowell. Zach is the Director of Planning and Programming for the Tri-Council Development Fund. He is responsible for advancing organizational strategy developing new programming initiatives and building strategic partnerships with community stakeholders. Zach is a real estate and construction industry veteran, experienced in market analysis, public and private sector development planning, affordable housing, asset-based economic development strategy, and labor management initiatives. He has spent more than 20 years helping build value for public and private sector entities and strengthen communities. And with that, Zach, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Todd, and welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We have an amazing panel for you today and we're gonna dive right into their insights and perspectives in just a moment. First though, we thought we would um, break the ice as it were with a quick uh, audience participation poll. So through the magic of Zoom, Brad is going to put up a question here. Um, our welcome poll, how likely do you think it is that a federal infrastructure bill will be signed um, into law this year. So you have uh, five categories to choose from. Brad's gonna leave that up for just a moment and then I'll get back to the results um, uh, just a little bit later. Um, but first, uh, just a few context, words of context. Uh, one thing we do know is that a massive investment in our country's infrastructure is long overdue. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers recently released its 2021 report card for America's infrastructure, uh, giving it an overall rank of C minus. Now, to be sure uh, this ranking is up from the D plus ranking that, we, uh, that they gave it four years ago, but it's uh, hardly a grade you'd wanna bring home to mom and dad. So in particular, 11 of the 17 categories evaluated received rankings in the D plus to D minus range. And among these were roads, schools, transit, and wastewater systems. The highest category ranked was rail with only a B. Um, the report goes on to say that the country faces a $2.6 trillion infrastructure funding shortfall over the next 10 years. That's the gap left over after current funding plans. So if not filled, um, the ASC uh, uh, estimates that this gap will result in losses of $10 trillion in economic growth and a sacrifice of 3 million jobs. Uh, recent coverage out of Texas and Mississippi has also given us an object lesson in just how fragile and inadequate and in fact in interconnected our infrastructure systems can be with the winter storm shutdowns of large portions of those states' power grids and water systems. The good news is that in this year of recovery, aided by political changes at the White House and Congress, uh, passage of a federal infrastructure bill or um, maybe bills seems more like a real possibility. And in fact, at least in theory with some level of bipartisan support. 
Uh, moreover, the Illinois Capitol Bill promises an infusion of $45 billion in statewide infrastructure spending in the coming years. So, but what would the scope and shape of a federal infrastructure program, if it passes, look like? What would it include? And at the state level, how will capital projects be prioritized? In addition to shoring up failing assets and ec supporting economic growth, will they be used to address structural inequities and increase climate resilience? Our expert panel this afternoon is going to dive into these and many other questions. We're gonna begin with each panelist engaging for about 10 to 15 minutes on infrastructure and real estate issues from the perspectives of their work and experience. Then we're, we'll move into a more informal roundtable discussion. You also have that uh, opportunity to ask questions of the panel during that time. And you can do so by utilizing the, the um, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And you can feel free to, to ask those questions at any point during, during the program. And hopefully we'll be able to get to a large portion of them. But first, let's take a look at our poll results. Brad, could you put those up? So we have a... We have an audience that's, that feels like uh, in the majority we're somewhat likely to see passage uh, this year of, uh, of an inf infrastructure bill. So we're not going to, we're not wholly optimistic, but we are, we, we are somewhat optimistic is what I'm hearing uh, from that poll. So we'll, we'll see in, the, in just a moment what our panelists have to say, but uh, first it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce them. So Tom, Tom um, Desku is a senior vice president with Ernst & Young Infrastructure Advisors. Tom's work focuses on uh, assessing the financial and commercial feasibility of unique, innovative, or complex infrastructure projects and advising on structuring of the contracting, financing, procurement, and development of these projects. Tom previously served as the managing director of finance for the Chicago Infrastructure Trust, working closely with the city to catalyze the delivery of modern, sustainable, and connected infrastructure solutions in the Chicago region. Um, Aaron Topston is a managing director for Walsh Investment Group, the investment division of Walsh Group. Aaron manages all infrastructure investment activities for Walsh across North America. Aaron's P3 experience includes civil and social infrastructure assets from early phases, phase partnering to financial close and construct construction oversight. In addition, Aaron is the founder and leader of Walsh's analytics and st strategic planning team. Sydney Griswold is a senior manager in Ernst & Young's Global Compliance and Reporting Tax Practice for Real Estate and is a licensed CPA in the states of Illinois and Virginia. She has over 10 years of experience in public accounting with a primary focus on real estate and private equity clients. Sydney leads multiple ta large tax compliance engagements for both private and public REIT clients and has extensive involvement with private equity fund structuring. So thank you all uh, again for joining us. And we're gonna start today um, with Tom. So Tom, some big changes are potentially afoot that would open up a lot of opportunities for states and communities and the companies that do infrastructure work. So I'd like to start with you and ask you to give our audience just sort of your outlook for infrastructure, infrastructure funding and spending both at the federal level and the state and local level. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Zach. Um, so um, I'll start off um, really quickly and, and just give a little more background on, on, on the work that, that I've been doing and, and, and the lens that um, through which I, I'm looking at this. So I'm part of infra Ernst & Young's infrastructure advisory practice. Um, and, and our work is really focused on advising public agencies on, on delivering large complicated projects, including um, infrastructure initiatives in, in the region. I've um, had the pleasure of working in the past with the city of Chicago, the Chicago Department of Transportation, uh, Illinois DOT, uh, the, and, and various other departments with, with the state. And, you know, I. I I think what a lot of these departments and agencies have been um, facing historically has been a funding shortfall for infrastructure and public services that have often forced local governments to either um, underinvest or, or look at creative funding and financing options to to advance infrastructure projects. And I think this trend has been particularly acute in Illinois in terms of underinvestment, where both federal and and state transportation 
funding has been stagnant for what feels like decades and, and um, has been constraining these state and local entities from addressing a growing backlog of infrastructure repairs and um, delivering new new projects necessary by, by you know, to serve their constituencies. Um, I'm going to focus my my discussion today on um, transportation and, and horizontal infrastructure, and, and um, you know, Aaron and, and, and Sydney might talk a little bit more as well around vertical construction and real estate. But happy to touch on that more as well during the the Q and A session. And I think the capital bill that was passed by the Illinois General Assembly in in the spring session of 2019. Um, as we think about the infrastructure outlook locally um, is, is really a, a critical thing to consider as part of this discussion, but both in terms of the funding it provides for projects in the short term, but also um, in attempting to address some of the structural issues that had driven underinvestment in the state's infrastructure programs in the previous years. So um, th thinking through the outlook, I think um, we, my thought is to start really with with funding, which is the the core consideration on on a lot of um, the constraints to to implementing um, large capital programs. And and I think to understand um, the 2019 capital bill, it's it's maybe helpful to first understand the methods by which Illinois funds its transportation programs. And um, uh, I think I'm going to get slightly technical and and and. Um, on, on some of this discussion, but but I also recognize that there's a lot of practitioners um, in attendance here who who uh, can probably get even more technical than, than I can, and so I uh, also welcome feedback through through the um, participation with, with the attendees throughout the process. But um, Illinois primarily funds its transportation program through three ongoing um, funding sources: the state motor fuel tax, um, the um, motor vehicle fees and federal transportation funding. Um, in addition, to, projects are also historically funded through um, intermittent dedicated bond issuances and proceeds, um, typically associated with the passage of, of a capital bill like the 2019 bill. Uh, prior to the 2019 bill, the Illinois fuel tax had not been raised since 1990 and had been at 19 cents uh, per gallon. I think through the 1990s and early 2000s, some of that um, was offset by, by you know, general increases in, in vehicle miles traveled. But following the um, 2008 Great Recession, there was a precipitous decline in vehicles miles vehicle mile travels. And, and also we were seeing increases in fuel efficiencies and it really caused a, a stagnation in, in the um, revenue source there. And, and Illinois had not passed a capital bill in, in a decade prior to um, the 2019 legislation. This is also coupled with, with a challenged federal funding environment. So um, at the federal level, infrastructure had historically been one of the more traditional areas of um, bipartisan cooperation as legislators from all stripes seem to see the benefit of infrastructure investment and in providing both job creation and improved constituent services. Um, but really since the major infrastructure components of, of the 2008-9 um, stimulus era, uh, the, the kind of rise in, in partisanship and, and congressional state stalemates in, in uh, DC had limited the success of federal infrastructure legislation and, and left a lot of state and local agencies to uh, fend for themselves and, and also uh, created a lot of infrastructure week jokes over the last four years. Um, and, and the upshot was that Illinois infrastructure, like, like that of many states across the country, has suffered due to a kind of chronic underfunding and, and disinvestment. And so, um, so what was in the 2019 capital bill and, and how's that gonna affect the infrastructure outlook in Illinois? Um, you know, I'll start first at looking at the, the funding sources and, and that have been identified in the bill. And the bill was um, for $45 billion over six years with um, sources of uh, bond proceeds as well as, as um, pay go sources. And, um, you know, I think particularly on, on that final point, the bill addressed some of the structural issues 
um, in, in terms of identifying new new revenue sources. So the doubling of the state fuel tax for the first time since um, 1990 to 38 cents per gallon is estimated to raise $1.2 billion a year annually. Um, and it's also indexed uh, to, to ensure that the tax continues to keep up with inflation over time and, and we're not left with another situation where uh, the motor fuel tax uh, is not raised for 30 years um, what, while infrastructure costs continue to escalate. Um, there are also tiered increases to vehicle registration fees, uh, new registration fee for electric vehicles, taxes on ride sharing, and new taxes on cable, satellite, and streaming services. And so I think it was very encouraging to see that um, the Capitol bill didn't just look at um, look at uh, raising debt, but but really trying to help with some of the underlying issues to to try to help close the funding gap moving forward. Um, and then the next question is, well, what what are these funds been allocated to, and it's really an array of uses. So it's it's kind of broadly split up across transportation and, and capital facilities. And, um, you know, 27 out of the $45 billion is uh, allocated towards transportation. Um, of that 11 billion for state funded highways, roads and bridges, and another 4.6 billion for locally funded statewide highways, um, roads and bridges nearly $6 billion for rail and mass transit facility projects, and another four and a half billion for um, use on, on statewide grade crossing, port facilities, airport facilities projects. So I think, um, you know, really a, a massive injection of, of um, state funding towards uh, um, a really needed uh, investment in the state's infrastructure. And, you know, what underpins the capital plan that um, the, what underpins this all is, is a capital plan in terms of how you actually go about to, to spend it. And I think um, following the capital bill, IDOT had gone through the process of um, updating its multi-year program and spending priorities. And um, I, I won't go into much detail there. And, and I'm sure there's people um, here that, that, that have a, a much better working knowledge than, than I do of the multi-year program. Uh, program itself, but you know it's important to note that the capital bill is supplementary to the um, some of the existing um, state and federal funds that were already um, already in place. And so the state road program is now looking at nearly 23 billion in a combined state, federal, and local funds, um, including 12 billion the the 12 billion in new funding, um, and and you've got really big projects that have been waiting in the wings like the you know billion dollar um i80 reconstruction and um and and uh modernization project but you're also getting investment in, in mass transit um uh you know nearly three billion dollars for the rta to um to to work with the um cta pace and metra um and uh, inner city rail, so 225 million for a Chicago to Quad Cities inner city rail, passenger rail project. Additional funding um, of $350 million for the CREATE program um, and the 75th Street Corridor Improvement Project there. Um, really looking to facilitate more efficient um, moves, moving of freight trains throughout the region and and you know additional funding for uh, airports and, and port facilities um, throughout the state and so that's kind of at the state level with the capital bill and and um then there's also the question well what's the federal role and outlook and and so um you know zach I, I appreciate you touched on the federal infrastructure bill at the start and and, and like most of the attendees I'm also uh, feeling more optimistic these days that, that uh, on the likelihood of the passage of a infrastructure bill. But I think even um, before focusing on on that infrastructure bill, uh, the the 1.9 trillion dollar recovery pass a package that was just passed by um, Congress and signed into law by President Biden already is providing some both direct and indirect benefits. I think to uh, the outlook for infrastructure spending in Illinois. So um, I think most directly it provides 
direct support to transit agencies that have been really hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic with over a billion dollars in transit funding that, that um, is expected to be allocated to help uh, the CTA Metro and PACE um, around uh, you know, lost operating expenses, uh, operating revenues and, and covering operating expenses and payroll costs, as well as nearly $400 million for um, Illinois airports. But I think the broader funding there that's provided to support and, and shore up state and local governments is, is particularly important to Illinois. I mean, um, I think as most of us know, Illinois is the lowest uh, rated state um, among the 50 states and um, is at the very uh, last notch in terms of investment grade rating at, at triple B minus. And when you look at the way um, Illinois debt was being priced at the start of the pandemic when, when people were, um, uh, where, where the credit markets were particularly acute in their concerns around the ability for um, state and local governments to cover the expected funding and budget shortfalls associated with COVID. Um, I think there was a real risk and concern that the state would not have the actual um, position and, and capacity to fund the capital bill um, with debt in the way that it was first conceived. And I think what we're seeing now, starting with um, the spreads on Illinois debt tightening um, the day following the Georgia Senate uh, runoff elections, when it, it when it became clear the Democrats would be able to have the votes to pass um, state and local uh, funding support in, in the recovery bill um, through last week when S&P um, raised its outlook from credit outlook from, from negative to stable on, on Illinois debt following the signing of the uh, recovery bill into law. And, and finally, just yesterday with the pricing of um, Illinois' latest round of general obligation debt at, at a, you know, significantly lower credit spreads that, than what they were priced at last May and, and the kind of um, heart of the uncertainty of the COVID uh, pandemic, um, I, I think there's a, a real um, indication here that that the recovery package has helped shore up the state's um, short and medium term outlook and, and allows it to continue pushing forward on you know spending priorities like the capital bill. And then I think that the the as everybody seemed to indicate, there's reason for further optimism that the Biden administration will be able to help move forward a dedicated infrastructure bill. Um, and they've indicated it's their core focus. And, um, you know, I think the details of that bill are not quite available yet, but, but the anticipation is that the um, infrastructure bill that was passed by the House last year will be used as the starting point. And so um, just as a kind of quick highlights of what was included in that, you know, nearly $500 billion for a five-year surface transportation reauthorization, um, more than $300 billion of that to the FHWA and $100 billion to the FTA, um, $37.5 billion for airports through the FAA, uh, $10 billion for the Corps of Engineers to address um, water resource projects, which, which can affect Lake Michigan, Illinois dams, and locks, um, and and you know a host of other things. So I I, I think, um, you know, appreciate that everybody's kind of uh, bearing with me as I ticked off through a lot of numbers. But but I think one message comes clear through through all this as as I think about it that coming out of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and I think there's finally this sense of optimism here. There's reason to be bullish on infrastructure investment in Illinois, and, and I think the timing couldn't be better for reinvesting in our transportation and transit infrastructure, and also creating the economic development and, and jobs that are desperately needed around the state um, coming out of this, you know, unprecedented time. So um, I'll stop there and, and let you kind of move on. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Tom, for that uh, excellent overview. Uh, that's a, it's a lot of really good detail, um, a lot of really interesting detail. I think it, what it sort of does is sort of focuses our attention on uh, the here and now um, while realizing that there's this sort of holy grail of, that everyone talks about a federal infrastructure package in the future. So thank you for that. 
Uh, moving on, Aaron, you have a lot of hands-on experience in the infrastructure and real estate space. Um, so could you share some of that experience with us and talk about where infrastructure investment may be heading? Maybe hit on while you're at it a few um, a few key Walsh projects. Sure. Um, and can you uh, hear and see me okay? Um, I can hear you. <laughs> there. Now I see you. Okay. I'll let you take Excellent. it away. Wonderful. Uh, so th thank you, uh, Zach. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and thank you to everyone that's able to join us today. My name is Aaron Topston. I work with Walsh here in Chicago. Uh, my role uh, is to help look after our, our investment work around infrastructure. Um, so Walsh, most folks know around the construction side, um, headquartered in Chicago, about 120 years old. Uh, we operate coast to coast. Uh, we self-perform quite a bit of work on the civil side. So the horizontal infrastructure, water treatment plants, uh, both wastewater and potable water. Uh, as well as we do a bit of vertical work here in town. Um, and, uh, and we also do a bit of building work uh, in, in the Southeast as well as up in, in uh, Seattle. Um, <clears throat> I thought maybe for today's framing is I sit, uh, you know, for, for most of my day job on an investment role, investing equity and ra um, raising project financing for large infrastructure projects, both building like government building, hospital, et cetera related, also civil infrastructure related, roads, bridges, airports, et cetera. Um, but would wanna frame the beginning of this conversation about how do we as a private sector firm navigate the expected growth of investment in infrastructure how do we look at Illinois specifically uh, and then touch upon the real estate investment side, which is another part of our investment efforts, uh, uh, which will hopefully yield a, a good uh, transition uh, into the third third uh, part of our panel here. Um, so first, outlook of infrastructure. Um, you know, sometimes I think it's helpful to, to think about this at, at a very, very macro view uh, for, for Illinois and specifically for Chicago. So Chicago's GDP as a metro area is a, a hair under $700 billion. Uh, it's a top 10 city globally uh, for a dozen reasons that all of us uh, know and love. Uh, and moreover, the stat that I always like to look at is it's the third largest intermodal port after Singapore and Hong Kong, two cities that historically everyone thinks of as port cities. Chicago often is not thought of as a port city per, to, to the layperson, right? Um, but we rely on infrastructure and the success of having a well-organized, well-connected infrastructure system in Illinois so that we can serve uh, the transfer of goods coast to coast as a core part of our GDP, a core part to how we interact with the United States and the world. Um, and so with that look, how do we navigate the investment of, of infrastructure? Um, we look favorably at states that, as Tom pointed out earlier, don't rely particularly heavily on federal funding alone. <clears throat> we look very favorably at the work that Illinois has done to become uh, uh, independent of, of just federal grant to fund its future infrastructure growth because of that interlink between the economy of Illinois and infrastructure investment. And, and so I think a, a, from a fundamental standpoint, that's a test we, we tend to look at uh, nationally and, and, and have come to appreciate uh, because it, it creates a consistency in delivery. Tom mentioned another part of, of delivery that I wanna hit on here is through the lens that, that we look at funding as part of it, but the multi-year uh, planning process to execute projects, the prioritization of projects is equally important, right? Uh, without planning, um, you know, execution becomes building the airplane while it's flown, um, and and that's not not excellent. Um, and uh, with uh, without funding, you, you you can't fly the airplane, right? So they they're very much hand, hand in glove. So when we look at navigating what's the growth potential in various uh, cities, states, and geographies across North America, those are the two sides that of the equation we often look at. Uh, a couple more uh, pieces to think about more granular as far as going down to the execution component here in, here in the state for, for us as a firm and in other firms like ourselves. Uh, design build packages for 
the tollway, IDOT, CTA, sister agencies, the airport, et cetera. Um, you know, the airport had successful um, plan uh, that they've they've put forward around their financing uh, here at O'Hare um, uh, about a year ago, a little less than a year ago. Each of the agencies obviously is well integrated in, into the longer range planning. Um, and, and so we see uh, quite a bit of potential DNC work in the near to medium term, not immediate shovels in the ground, but kind of in that near to medium term. Um, you know, part of that is because planning is, is still moving forward as, as many of the, the practitioners here on the phone probably have a, have a far better lens into than I do. Um, but um, that, that's kind of the, 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 the lay of the land has a quality across a lot of different uh, potential investors in infrastructure, meaning state agencies or, or sister agencies of the city, et cetera. Um, and with not, you know, a particularly one being um, <clears throat> the, 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 the overarching single target of, uh, of investment, although uh, undoubtedly IDOT has not had a capital plan in a while, and, and it will probably be a, a substantial one as, as that rolls out. Um, <clears throat> a few thoughts on alternative delivery, you know, as uh, today's environment is still a very low rate uh, environment. Um, I think strategically, that's part of the reason uh, the state of Illinois issued geo debt. Um, it's also a reason other procurement agencies are looking to procure work now. Financing is inexpensive. Um, construction market, uh, you know, is is remains competitive, but is quickly creeping up on 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 price increases. Um, and so, um, you know, timing wise, it makes a, a very good argument from the economic fundamentals that it's a great timing to look at delivery. And we've started to see more positive experience around alternative delivery here in the state of Illinois. Uh, the, the example that that uh, many look to is um, the CTA's RPM project, which Walsh is, is very fortunate to be working with um, with our JV partner and, and CTA and many others on, on that one. Um, and, you know, overall, that experience has been quite good. You know, uh, throughout COVID, work has continued to progress well. Um, it is the largest project in CTA's history, and it is their first very large design build project. Um, and to see that progress through what has been a very difficult 2020, I think, demonstrates a resiliency and a flexibility of the delivery model. And moreover, it helps uh, match up the good timing to accelerated delivery, which maybe we can touch on in, in the Q&A, if, if that makes sense. A um, couple other bullet points on CTA for those curious on the RPM project. Uh, the flyover bridge, um, which, which will go over toward the Southport stop from Belmont, um, is progressing toward completion this summer. Um, we remain very proud and, and work very hard around our community outreach, uh, including scholarship efforts, uh, workforce development programs, a community lending program that has been, uh, I think, really excellent. Um, and you know, design development has, has progressed nicely with good work from everyone, right? Design build um, is, is truly a team effort, right? Uh, and and is, has been really good effort all, all around the board to, uh, to make that a success. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I, I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit from uh, just the execution component and the strategy component. Where, where, do we, where do we see growth and how do we navigate the expected reinvestment in infrastructure here in our state to, infrastructure investment. How do we, uh, Walsh, look at investing our equity, whether that be horizontal infrastructure or vertical infrastructure? Um, overall, infrastructure investment in, in P3 through availability payments is quite limited. Um, those are examples where uh, a state would, would transfer um, design, build, operate, and maintain responsibilities inclusive of financing to a private sector consortium for let's say 20 years, 30 years um, to have the asset built and maintained and then handed back uh, and pay a monthly rent during the operating period. Those are, is very limited, I think for Illinois in, in the near term. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the view of where is private sector infrastructure investment more, more likely transactionally feasible is in the limited revenue risk opportunities uh, where the private sector takes takes a revenue risk, N not things where there's no investment like the the um, parking meters, but rather true investment opportunities, uh, whether that's road expansion or otherwise, or as asset um, transfer ones. Uh, Thompson Center is a great example of a, of a building that you know is is uh, um, you know arguably underutilized and has great potential uh, into the future. Um, 
those aren't a target for our firm, but you know, I'm observing um, uh, some things in, in, in this, in our community that, that are, you know, pretty compelling and, um, you know, I think have some appetite in, in the not too distant future. Mm, other major developments in this, in the city of Chicago in particular, uh, like Lincoln Yards and, and the 78 and other, uh, mega developments from, from a real estate side are, are really unique. There, there's only a handful of cities across the United States. Um, New York, Nashville, here in Chicago, um, you know, to a lesser extent, uh, uh, parts of Atlanta, et cetera, that are seeing very, very, very large real estate development upside. Um, and I think that really doubles down into the, the, the growth of our city and the growth of, of our economy overall coming out of, um, out of a, a COVID. And so those look quite promising. More tactically, where do we look uh, on on that picture overall. I think there will be quite a few rehabilitations, whether that's simple stuff like, as folks go back to work in the downtown um, central business district, how are lobbies reconfigured? How do we uh, make ingress and egress uh, more seamless for the, the current reality of, of managing um, COVID exposure, even post-vaccination? Um, how do we look at reuse for facilities that uh, are, are overbuilt from their original purpose compared to today's market where we do have a lot of office space that's that's come online um, and, and is probably opportunities for for adaptive reuse. Um, you know, we look at things like hotel recovery, you know, I, I have a hard time predicting this. We're very fortunate to to have, um, you know, a few hotels and look, uh, it's is is the recovery going to be J shaped or not? You know, I'm not quite sure. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it certainly will be a good bellwether for, for the wider uh, real estate recovery post-COVID um, separate from the, the mega projects. Um, and so that hopefully gives a, a pretty good overview of how we look at navigating the environment, uh, where we see opportunity on a cons pure construction side and, and from an investment side. Uh, and, uh, you know, Zach, happy to turn back to you to, uh, to continue with the program. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Um, really appreciate you sharing your insights, experience. Um, particularly interesting, I thought, were the um, your thoughts on sort of innovation and opportunities inherent in that innovation, both sort of in processes and in the uh, physical sense. And I'm and hopefully we can get into a little bit more of that um, as as we progress here in the program today. So uh, uh, moving along, though, Sydney. Um, along with big changes in spending, the Biden administration is also proposing some big changes in tax policy. And I know there are other changes coming down the pike, you know, at the state level, et cetera. Um, could you give us an overview of these changes and their potential impacts, um, both, you know, federally and at the state and local levels? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Sydney Griswold, and I'm a senior manager in our real estate tax practice here in Chicago. Um, as mentioned, I have over 10 years of experience in the market, um, primarily serving real estate clients. Um, the clients and experience I have are both in the private and public REIT structures, um, fund structures, and joint venture experience. Um, some of the property types that I've covered include commercial, um, multifamily, student housing, data storage, self-storage, and senior living as well. Um, so expanding on some of the topics that my colleagues just covered, I'd like to share some proposed tax updates and consequences, both from the federal Biden tax plan, as well as the Chicago um, and Illinois local perspective. So starting with our federal um, tax plan, the Biden plan released prior to the election um, would enact a number of policies that could raise taxes on both individuals and corporations. Um, alongside this, there could also be an increase in the capital gains tax rate, as well as the payroll tax impact. The overall plan would aim to raise tax revenue by $3.3 trillion over the next decade. Um, an example of some of those current proposed changes to the plan include an increase of the corporate tax rate to 28%, um, though there's various uh, rates being thrown around, we've heard 28, 25, um, uh, a variety of options but an overall rate increase. Um, some other changes include the repeal of the CARES Act excess business loss provision and a potential 15% minimum tax on book income greater than 100 million. 
from an individual perspective, um, the proposed tax rate is 39.6% um, alongside a phase out of the new 199A deduction that was implemented in the TCJA. Um, in addition, there is a payroll tax increase uh, possibility for incomes greater than 400,000. Um, for some of our individual tax clients, they've been really focused on the potential end to the use of the state tax planning stepped up basis. And alongside that, a lot of our real estate clients have been focused on the possible end of the use of like-kind exchanges um, under 1031 as a vehicle for deferring gain. The Build Back Better plan um, represents the corresponding investment spend to um, these tax increases. The plan would aim to spur demand for U.S. products um, through a $400 billion investment, as well as a $2 trillion expected investment to support infrastructure development and clean energy. An additional $100 billion is expected to be used in the Affordable Housing Fund to construct and upgrade affordable housing uh, with a $10 billion component for energy efficiency. So from a tax planning perspective, the key theme is tax rate increases, reduction in expense recognition, and reduction in additional benefits used to offset taxable income. Um, so at EY, we've had a lot of discussions with our clients, both individual, corporate, and flow through to see what tax planning strategies we can implement, um, both for companies and individuals uh, to help combat this possible tax increase. So a few options of things to keep in mind for yourself and your businesses um, is if there's an option to accelerate any income into the current tax year or defer any deductions into a later tax year where there could possibly be a higher rate. So some examples of um, things our clients are considering and, and that are important to keep in mind are, um, you know, property sales. Is there an option for any potential dispositions of properties to be pushed forward into 2020, uh, 2021 when you may be able to get the better capital gains um, tax rate versus, um, you know, pushing forward to 2022 or 2023? Um, obviously, this is a, a business decision and there's more than tax involved here, but you know, if there's an option to push something forward, that could be very beneficial. Um, another option our clients are looking at is a review of advanced payment streams. Um, if, you're, if it's possible to take the income into account um, today versus down the road, um, that could be helpful as well by offsetting it against the lower tax rate. A lot of our clients are also considering um, possible method changes, either positive or negative, um, that could help um, move income or recognize income or deductions in the years, which would be the most beneficial from a tax rate perspective. So some of our clients are considering um, performing a method change analysis um, to see if there can be a positive 481A adjustment in the current year. This would mean changing a method so that more income is recognized today. For example, performing an analysis under Section 460 for long-term contract accounting and whether there are any options um, outside of the completed contract method to use. So for example, if the taxpayer is able to provide or to apply the percentage of completion method um, to the gross contract price for recognizing revenue, this could permit the taxpayer to recognize more income today versus waiting for the project to be finished. Method changes can also be used to um, uh, determine when deductions are recognized. So um, it's possible to perform an analysis under UNICAP for Section 263A that could also have beneficial results. Um, for example, some clients may be considering um, an election to capitalize their SG&A costs into fixed assets. This would allow um, the client to put that, those costs into the basis of their assets and depreciate um, over the future versus expensing today. The application of unit cap can also have an added benefit of impacting the 163J limitation of the interest expense rules, meaning you could have a double benefit. You could, also, you could be taking those expenses and putting them into a year with a, a higher tax rate, as well as removing that expense from your taxable income to which you apply the 163J limitation. Along these lines, um, interest capitalization rules have been a hot topic for the IRS lately. And several um, you know, businesses we've seen are looking into those rules and if there's the option to put that interest um, into the basis of their assets by capitalizing it versus deducting it. 
um, this would also have a similar impact as um, the option previously discussed, where not only are you pushing your deductions to a future tax year, but you're also removing them from the 163J limitation calculation. Other options include uh, taking a look at any bad debts um, that are on your books and whether you should be recognizing those on partial worth worthlessness versus full worthlessness. Um, it's more, it's it's the assumption you would want to take that sooner rather than later, um, but if you're able to wait and not apply partial worthlessness and take it upon full worthlessness, that could help push deductions into a future tax year as well. Um, several of our clients are also taking a look at each of the business entities within their structure and the facts and circumstances around each of the um, activities performed within those entities. Um, the goal of this analysis is to separate and identify different trades or businesses performed within each entity. So a separate trade or business needs to meet several requirements, um, one of which is including um, the maintenance of separate books and records for each business. Um, by applying and determining these separate trades or businesses, um, the entity is able to select different accounting methods and tax treatments um, that best fit each trade or business. So by uh, performing this analysis for each entity in your structure, this could help um, mitigate some of these concerns as well. Finally, an analysis of the application of the net oper operating loss deductions um, and targeting the use of those for either a carry back or a carry forward um, can help offset taxable income. Um, so finally, from a Illinois and Chicago local tax perspective, there are also a few updates to discuss. The most timely being the recent market trend analysis performed by the city's current assessor. The analysis uh, reviewed characteristics of properties within the city and considered the following. First, it looked at the income of the real property. It also looked at the physical characteristics of the property, such as size, parking, amenities, elevators, etc. And it looked at the inventory of spaces in the building, including rooms, lease dates, vacancies, and concessions. The end result indicated a few key takeaways. Um, first, that the estimated market values in 2018 for Chicago commercial assessments were too low, and estimated market values were at 52% of their sales price. For example, a property worth 1 million was taxed as if it was worth 520,000. Second, that the assessments were not uniform amongst properties of similar characteristics. And finally, that the assessments were regressive, meaning that properties with higher sales prices were more underassessed than properties with modest sales prices. So the results of the survey indicated that property tax assessment policies and procedures could use a revamp and may result in a large impact for all property owners downtown, both residential and commercial. In addition to this Chicago update, um, Illinois has issued several select governor's proposals recently back in the fall of 2020. Uh, these proposals don't aim to increase tax on individuals, but would strive to raise 932 million through business changes. Possible changes include 100,000 per year cap on net operating loss deductions for three years, a decoupling of bonus depreciation from federal tax treatment, the reversal of the repeal of the corporate franchise tax, and a possible elimination of the add-on income tax credit for construction, construction job payroll expenditures. So in summary, from a tax perspective, there are some significant changes on the horizon, both from a federal and state and local perspective, um, though I would encourage each of you to you know, consult your tax advisors as to if there's any opportunities to revisit some possible tax planning scenarios um, specific to your business or yourself to, to help mitigate some of these uh, rate and policy changes. So I'm going to turn it back to Zach for the panel, but thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sydney. I really appreciate that timely information and for you uh, basically closing the loop for us on spending and tax, the tax environment um, and where we're heading into the future. So if I could have everyone, oh, there you are. There you all are. <laughs> so we're going to start the um, the round. This is a very round, informal roundtable discussion portion of the program. We're going to dig a little deeper into some of the topics that have already been discussed, as well as um, answer some new questions. And you are all invited to share your questions. Just um, click on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and ask your question, and we will 
um, see it and we'll get to as many as we can. We also had some that were um, that were pre-submitted um, upon registration. So we, we hope to get to those as well. But first of all, I wanted to, this is a question, this could be for anybody, um, but um, that something that's on the mind, I think of a lot of the, a lot of our, um, our audience members here today, and certainly on my mind is the, the impact of the pandemic, you know, and how, how does the pandemic impact our infrastructure needs particularly um, are there lessons that we have learned um, during the pandemic that we are going to move forward with? Has it exposed weaknesses in our infrastructure that we, we need to deal with? So I, I don't know if, um, Tom, you want to take a shot at that first or, or Aaron? I'm, ha I'm happy to jump on, on, on the jump ball here. So, um, you know, I, I think sometimes the definition of in infrastructure is an interesting one. And, and certainly in the current vernacular uh, broadband is part of infrastructure. Um, and I think through the pandemic, we've, uh, you know, very unfortunately seen a huge disparity between folks who have good access to broadband and folks who don't. Um, there's been a few private sector innovations and, and changes in the fundamental um, completion of broadband projects that I find interesting. Uh, we've noticed a number of companies that are, are starting to build uh, last mile fiber networks uh, in, in, in urban corridors, uh, most prevalently out west is where we've seen it directly, um, as well as in Texas. But, but, you know, equally, you know, here in Chicago, AT&T has done a little more. We have mostly proprietary fiber here in, here in town. Um, the, the provider owns the line versus building a pipe and filling it with whoever wants to rent it at one given time is, is the new model, uh, which is far more efficient for the consumer far more uh, approachable from a cost basis for a much wider percentage of, of the population and probably just a smarter commercial business model. Um, you know, and, and that's on the commercial side. I think on, on, on the civic side, folks like um, Ken Griffin's uh, contribution to Chicago Connected, um, which sought to bring broadband to about 60,000 homes here in the city is a really interesting trend around a better awareness of that disparity not saying that's a perfect fix, but but certainly I think as we look at infrastructure historically, you know, myself included working at Walsh have defined it really as as transportation and, and government infrastructure has started to broaden that view to mean core services to support communities. And, and I think that uh, perspective change is going to happen in on the federal level as we look for a bill. Um, I would I would anticipate some inclusion of, of uh, utility services as a component of, of the wider funding and how we think about infrastructure 10 years from now than we do today. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's a great point, Aaron. And, and you know, um, our practice has been doing more and more <clears throat> around broadband expansion at the state and city level across the country. Um, and, and I think what's interesting, you know, talking about the Capitol bill earlier, is the one thing that, that ended up being very, very uh, prescient in there is $420 million in broadband expansion funding to DCEO. And, and that was um, part of the bill in 2019 prior to the onset of um, the you know, COVID-19 pandemic, but I think has given the state um, really good resources to work with on, on being able to uh, help provide uh, funds to expand broadband access to rural and underserved communities throughout the state. So I, I think that worked out really well. I think that the other thing, um, Zach, that I would mention is someone that um, took the blue line uh, into downtown every day prior to last March is um, I, I think it's really critical for cities like Chicago, New York, and and others that, that have these historical um, uh, historically well-utilized transit systems that have been obviously very underutilized for the past 12 months to, to make sure that we're making the continued investment in them and, and not losing the kind of um, capabilities and, and, and services that transit provides um, uh, in urban environments like Chicago. And, and, you know, in many ways, you know, it's, it's the heart of, of, um, of the city's transportation and transit network. So I, I think that that's something that I was really, you know, I think it was a really great development to see the federal funding 
um, to support transit agencies come through the recovery bill. And, and I think it's gonna be incumbent on um, the state and city and, and um, um, and hopefully with the support of the federal government to continue to, to invest in transit in, in and around um, the state and, and not let that kind of fall by the wayside. Thanks, uh, Sydney. Are there any specific tax implications or, that, uh, or innovations maybe that um, you see arising from the pandemic era? You know, we've had a lot of discussions with our clients specifically, you know, in the multifamily or the um, commercial space about how they're going to use their space. You know, what does that mean from a tax perspective? You know, a lot of our clients um, are REITs and own properties through the REIT structure, which is pretty restrictive on what you're allowed to do um, with your tenants and how you're allowed to use your space. Um, so, you know, we have clients that want to convert their space. We've seen people who wanted to use space for um, you know, to help with hospital overflow or things like that, where maybe they weren't able to without, um, you know, getting certain uh, permissions for that activity. Um, on a go forward basis, uh, we've seen some interesting um, updates with regard to both the REIT's ability to invest in its tenants and as well as the REIT's ability to invest in infrastructure. Um, so there was an interesting article the other day on the Retail Revitalization Act of 2021 uh, where the goal is to help out some of these commercial tenants. Um, and within that, there's the possibility where a REIT could invest in its tenant. Um, currently, they're only allowed to own up to 10% of their tenant, but um, the act is looking to increase that to 50%. Um, so that would help a lot with our commercial tenants, you know, our mall clients where, you know, maybe they really need that anchor um, business to stay in in order to have a functioning property. Um, if they're able to help do some inflow into those accounts without uh, messing up their REIT status, that could help keep their businesses afloat. Um, with that, from an infrastructure perspective, um, you know, we've seen this over the years, a trend towards, you know, new assets being permitted by REITs. Um, you know, we've seen storage racking and data centers, pipelines, solar, signage, you know, all kinds of things that aren't your true uh, core real estate asset be permitted in a REIT structure. Um, and so in the, the current environment, it's looking like there may be the possibility to expand um, those asset types that REITs are able to use to better allow for um, you know, investment by others, either in a private or public REIT structure um, to support some of those infrastructure investments and allow more non-governmental investments into those asset types. So. Um, you know, coming out of COVID, I think that'll be really important to allow, um, you know, those REIT clients and those REIT investors to expand kind of their real estate portfolio in that way to, to help support infrastructure as well as, um, you know, leverage that, help some of their tenants get through this time as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, moving on, since we've been talking about major infrastructure funding potentials at sort of both the state and local levels and as well as the federal levels, um, could you comment, and this again is for, for basically anyone, on the roles of the federal government versus state governments and local governments in terms of infrastructure funding and investment? Um, if anyone want to, want to start off with that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll maybe keep it pretty brief, but I think, you know, we, we I touched a little bit on, on this topic earlier, and I think Aaron hit on it as well. Um, you know, I think historically there's been a large reliance by, by state and local governments on federal funding and, and grant programs to advance um, their transportation funding and planning. I think that a lot of states over the last decade have seen a need to shift the way that they think about um, their reliance on federal support and seek to be more independent because as everything has become more political and partisan and, and more difficult to get legislation um, complete in Washington, DC, it, it's created a greater degree of uncertainty around the timing and quantum of, of funding of, available from the federal government. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with Tom. And you know, rather than a political argument, I'm gonna make an economic and, and um, uh, you know, kind of ho hopefully pretty uh, logically fact-based one. Um, our population in the United States is aging. 
um, health care uh, paid for by the federal government, regardless of any new programs or political views on that, cost more for an aging population. That's going to be a bigger percentage of our federal budget. Um, Social Security uh, is reaching an imbalance with the number of people paying into it versus withdrawing it as baby boomers age. That's going to cost more for the federal government. We continue to issue more debt on a federal basis. We will pay more in interest. That's going to cost more for the federal government. Um, electric uh, more and more electric vehicle miles are driven every year. That is going to reduce the gas tax realization, which is already at a very challenging level federally. That is going to reduce the amount of money available for infrastructure investment. So those macroeconomic factors are working against the federal government's ability to, to easily, without a lot of political will, fund a lot of infrastructure. So to Tom's point, and I think we made it earlier and why we look favorably to an economically um, less linked uh, local and state infrastructure plan. I think that's far more resilient and, and probably where we're gonna see a majority of the United States 10 to 15 years from now versus um, where we are today. Thank you uh, for that. Um, so the, the funding is for infrastructure is great. And you know I'm sure it's very welcome all over, but how will these projects actually get done? And most importantly, what are your thoughts on how they will or they will be, one question, or should be, another question, prioritized? Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, I'll, I'll split that question in, into two. And so I think one is delivery you know, of the projects. And, and I think of that in terms of both procurement and, and contracting. And, and I think Illinois, it's interesting. It's one of only four states right now that doesn't have authority for design build authority for transportation projects at, at the state level. And so when we talk a lot, you know, when Aaron and I are in um, uh, the, the P3 world of infrastructure, there's this idea of innovative delivery and, and innovative contracting structure. And, and I think in Illinois, design build is, is almost thought of as innovative. And, and I think that's, that, that's not true in, in most of the country. Um, I think you're seeing more design build in Illinois nonetheless, right? So under the home rule authority that um, local government units have that, that are less constrained than, than IDOT and the state are, um, so when I was working with the city of Chicago, um, we completed two design build projects, the relocation of, of um, uh, the main uh, repair garage and, and headquarters for the Department of Fleet and Facility Management and, and the Public Safety Training um, Academy. Um, I know Aaron right now and, and Walsh are working with the CTA on a massive design build um, initiative around the, the red purple um, line modernization project on, on, um, on the existing uh, CTA infrastructure. And so I, I think um, it would be great uh, to see more design build. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, an effective way to, to kind of better optimize the life cycle costs of an asset and, and avoid some of the um, constraints, both time-wise and contracting-wise that are sometimes um, been, been um, creating inefficiencies on, on design bid build. I think when you look at more P3 design build, finance, operate, and maintain, and, and you know, sometimes you see those types of projects and, and that delivery model when funding is more constrained and um, procuring entities and owners are really looking to defray their um, funding obligations over 30, 40 years if they don't have all the funding available up front for the capital cost. So I actually think in an environment where you might have greater um, infrastructure funding at the state and federal level, you may see less of a need from the owner's perspective to push some of those P3 type um, arrangements. Um, so I, I'll, I'll let others jump in um, on that as well. I, I agree with Tom. I mean, I'm, I, uh, I, you know, I, 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 uh, I believe that DB serves a very valuable purpose to accelerate timeline, accelerate delivery um, and, and can be done very well. It, it, it comes down to having a really good um, level of engagement between all parties involved um, and, and requires a lot of effort, right? It's not a push button, you know, get project type of approach. 
um, it still requires a, a lot of collaboration, a lot of engagement, um, and and um, can be incredibly successful to per, to deliver complex projects in, in certain times. And back to the point earlier, right now is a great time to be in procurement and, and getting projects out, uh, out, out into the community um, because in the relative basis, I think costs widely, finance and otherwise, are a little lower now than they will be in two years. Um, so that's, that's an advantageous to consider DB as well. I do agree on the P3 side as well. Most importantly, do not fit a square peg into a round hole. Um, trying to do a P3 project to say, look at the risk we've transferred as public sector to, to, to the developer doesn't help anyone, right? You know, risk exists on the project saying, hey, actually, you know, hazmat risk or sub, subsurface geotechnical conditions, that's, that's your problem, builder, designer, right? Doesn't, doesn't help. Um, the reality of there's still a cost to fix it. That cost doesn't just disappear. Just disappear. Um, so if a P3 is a preferred path forward, there has to be a very logical, genuine commercial need to proceed that way, usually around executing delivery more quickly, accessing private sector financing versus traditional public capital markets, which is very relevant to certain cities, um, not the city of Chicago, but other ones. Um, and um, being able to capture value in things like reducing real estate footprint from existing leases and consolidating into one facility. Capital markets don't get that, private sector developer mate, those make a little more sense. But unless there's that real commercial value for P3, square peg round hole doesn't, doesn't magically add, add value. And you know, it's um, it, the right risk allocation is very, very, very important um, across all delivery models. Very good. So what I'm, I'm hearing sort of from both of you is this sort of triad of innovation, urgency, and collaboration on these projects going forward. Cindy, uh, anything to add from a tax or other perspective? Um, no, all of that um, is definitely interesting updates for the market. So I'm interested to hear your insights on that. All right. Um, we got... Um, quite a few questions actually um, regarding um, sort of an equity lens. Um, so it seems that infrastructure development, if done sensibly and equi equitably, can be a critical support for um, underserved neighborhoods. I think, uh, you know, um, sort of broadly of investment in transit, broadband, some of the things we've already talked about, uh, schools, to name, name a few. Um, so if um, you could comment, maybe start with you, Tom, on um, how we could look at infrastructure through an equity lens and where some perhaps key gains could be made. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and um, uh, you know, I, I want to recognize that, that I'm by, by no means an expert on this subject, but, you know, following um, the, the, the trends in, in the area, I mean, I, I would break it down at first into two things, right? There's project prioritization, where are you choosing to spend your funding and what are you choosing to spend it on and, and who is it serving and to what benefit? And then there's also the question of, of how are you delivering your projects and who are the contractors and subcontractors and who is making up um, the workforce on, on the project site? And, you know, I think in Chicago and the state of Illinois, um, those issues have, have really come to the forefront based, you know, um, and, and I think to your point, Zach, right, investment in transit, investment in transit pr projects that serve communities that are underserved by transit right now. So, um, you know, the red, red line extension south or the collaboration between the CTA and Metro around providing more transit-like um, more transit-like service along the, the um, uh, Metro Electric South Shore um, corridor um, and being able to make the investments to provide better transit accessibility and service and, and more frequent and reliable service to communities that traditionally um, have been underinvested in. 
Um, I, I think there's a question of broadly, how do you prior prioritize projects? And I think you've got organizations like the MPC and the Civic Committee that are right now um, looking to promote um, ways to, to better uh, identify and prioritize projects. And, and I think to do so with an eye towards um, uh, equity lens and having that be part of the equation and understanding the impact and the benefit compared to the to the cost of a project. And then finally, I would say, you know, I, I think the city of Chicago and the state have been um, uh, very focused the last number of years on making sure that um, things like BP requirements or DBE at a you know from a federal level, MBE, WBE at the city level. Um, that those commitments are, are meaningful and are met and that um, beyond that, there's also um, workforce requirements and, and that folks working um, on infrastructure projects, um, that the work site reflects the demographics of the community that they're working on. So I think that's been an issue, uh, a, a issue of focus, and I think it will continue to be more so, especially with some of the leadership changes at the state level. Thank you. Um, Aaron, any perspective from particularly, I'm thinking of the, the um, red purple line modernization project or the red line extension project on that? Sure. So, so uh, maybe I'll just touch on RPM, uh, red purple line. You know, my, my colleague Ted Gibbs and Kwaku Thompson and, and Dave Shire and the entire team there have done an amazing job, I think, uh, of engaging the community, focusing on workforce development. Um, being putting a, a tremendous amount of effort into thinking outside of the box, such as the scholarships um, that that project has helped award, um, engaging actively with CPS um, to increase STEM uh, training awareness, and, and it, you know using the job site as uh, not just creating a quality and equitable opportunity, frankly, um, through the final built asset in transit, but also. Um, as an opportunity for career growth, learning and community engagement, um, up and down, you know, immediate workforce through things like STEM training and, and, and can continued investment and opportunity in our industry. Uh, really want to compliment the team there. And to Tom's point, not, not just having the requirements as part of procurement, but finding counterparties that put a lot of effort, time and energy, and really want to see it through is as important, um, which gets into to procurement a bit. And, you know, Low price is often viewed as as um, kind of the decision maker on, on construction often, but you know building stuff is so much more than low price. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's a, a really important part of having best value um, procurements along with alternative delivery is who, who can actually execute against the, the commitments and is doing so in a way that is uh, supportive of, of our communities and, and in a wider, um, you know, frankly, federal investment in, in infrastructure development. Thank you. I, that's my favorite line. Building stuff is so much more than low price. <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. That's great insight. Uh, thank you. Um, so we had um, some questions about um, specific sort of sectors or projects. And in fact, one we uh, just got it, and if someone wants to um, take, a, take a stab at this, um, this is, um, the, qu the question is, uh, per the New York Times air cargo is projected to quadruple by 2040, partly due to the pandemic. Uh, with I-80 already being very congested, what are your thoughts on the proposed South Suburban Airport and the Ileana Expressway? So anyone want to go out on a limb here and, um, and make some, you know, get your crystal ball out and then... <laughs> I'll 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 um you know I'll caveat this by saying that I, I think both Aaron and I in different roles um, spent probably more than a year of our life uh, in, <laughs> engaged on the previous iteration of the Ileana Expressway and and uh, also have uh, have taken uh, have spent time working on on the South Suburban Airport in the past. Um, I think those are, are are tough things to to kind of weigh in on. I, I think. Um, both of those projects um, have had their political challenges um, and, and were really also advanced by, by um, you know, specific principles at the time. So, so, you know, I think with Ileana, you had a, a very willing counterpart in Indiana and, and, and my, you know, they, I believe, completed the 
EIS work on that project, even once the procurement was suspended, because, you know, from from the Indiana point of view, it's it's a very beneficial project. I think from the Illinois point of view, there's been um, differing perspectives on it, and and um, I can't say I've heard anything more recently uh, on that. South Suburban Airport, I, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. There was there was funding allocated in the um, in the capital bill around the the construction of some of the uh, intersections off of um, the interstate there related to it. So I mean, clearly there's still some will and interest by um, uh, folks in in that region to continue to promote it. But but I also think that that um, it has, uh, you know, um, some significant challenges to moving forward as well. I, I don't know if uh, I, I I'm gonna uh, uh, as Tom said we 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 were a bitter and I've spent a substantial portion of time on on both of those projects. Um, I'll make two observations on air cargo. One is if most most airports right now are down on revenue, right? Folks are not flying a lot, um, and the um, value that an airport collects from landing fees on cargo um, is often more profitable than passenger landing fees. Um, but if you look at the physical footprint of an airport, cargo often has a much smaller physical footprint. Even just look at O'Hare, right? O'Hare is, is a massive complex. Um, and uh, within that, cargo is, is a relatively small portion compared to the five passenger terminals. This is not unique to O'Hare. This exists at almost every major airport in the United States, including cargo heavy airports like Miami. Um, and so what I think will happen in the immediate term is a rebalancing to see more cargo uh, on existing airport lands and, and the reuse of those existing airport lands and existing um, runways, taxiways, et cetera, hard stands um, to, to do that um, versus immediate growth of a, of a whole new airport in, in the near term. Thank you. Um, appreciate you uh, uh, willing to stretch on that on that on that topic. Um, we also got a couple questions that have to do with sort of non-auto oriented transportation spending um, that are, are sort of more or less related. Um, one is, what does non-oriented uh, transportation spending look like um, under the Biden administration and with Transportation Secretary Pete? Um, and then the other sort of, I look at it as a sort of a corollary uh, question. I look at that as transportation of people. Um, the, the corollary question I'm seeing here is what funding will be available for the development of, of rail facilities? And obviously, um, you know, so key to the Chicago area. Um, so um, I was wondering if you had any particular um, perspectives you'd like to share on that. Either or those of those questions or both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think if it, the the question you know if the question is you know what's the outlook for transit and rail um, spending, um, you know, I think there was as I mentioned earlier, capital bill funds allocated, but but I think on the on the transit um, side. Um, the COVID pandemic has hit transit agencies really hard, right? So I, I think it's a little tough to say right now, how does transit spending, um, how does service and expansion look like in the short and medium term? And, and I think that, um, you know, the early indicators are that the federal government is, is, is gonna try to support um, transit in this manner. Um, rail, you know, I think, People think of uh, Associate President Biden with uh, riding the Amtrak to, to his home in Delaware and, and DC and back. And, and obviously, um, um, he's been supportive of, of rail in the past. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what's what's ultimately introduced as part of the infrastructure bill. But but I can't say I have um, a really informed view on on what what that looks like right now. You know, I'll compliment Mayor Pete in that he would push the envelope to be progressive around non-car oriented transit in South Bend, Indiana, which is a very car heavy town, right? Uh, so, so I think um, his willingness to listen 
and be engaged uh, will certainly open the window. But, you know, similar to Tom, I'd have a hard time to forecast what it really looks like other than um, I think it's probably a more focused conversation point for many in the federal government than has it, has it been historically over the last, you know, not just eight, uh, four years, but frankly, um, decade plus. All right, very good. Well, I can tell you from uh, my perspective or my, my hope and dream, because I'm from a small town in the middle of Kansas, is I fully expect high-speed rail lines within the next four years from Chicago directly into Lindsborg, Kansas. So that's that's my infrastructure dream. <laughs> that just hit my desk, Zach. I didn't know that was really? uh, <laughs> so, so personal. <laughs> that's, that's in the new infrastructure plan, I believe. <laughs> so um, we are getting sort of close to time. So if anybody out there wants to um, posit another question through the Q&A, please do. Um, meanwhile, I did want to um, ask the panel about technological innovations in the construction industry, because there have been quite a few and there have been a lot of sort of tech startups, construction tech startups that have, have grown up sort of um, in, as a result of this and also fueling it. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts on perspectives on how that is changing the construction industry and what we can look forward terms to in terms of, um, of delivery and, and other, other aspects of construction? Absolutely. You know, I, I'm happy to jump on that one. I, I spend quite a bit of time with it here, here at Walsh and, um, you know, we, we certainly embrace technology. Um, I want to highlight a couple of things when, when folks talk about tech innovation in, in our industry, what does that really mean? Um, one is the opportunities for technology to help construction. We see as very supplemental, not replacing, you know, our labor, our professional service. At the end of the day, construction, design, everyone on this phone um, presenting provides a professional service built on trust, built on an ability to execute. Where I see tech being the most helpful in construction delivery, as well as other public infrastructure related delivery, is in easing administration, creating efficiencies on documentation, communication, and building out data to make better decisions. At the end of the day, the, the individuals making the decisions are people on site, um, people in program management, um, and, and people in planning. Uh, but the utilization of technology to build a better pool of information and to streamline the efficiency of communication on a, on, you know, between many parties on a complex job site is very beneficial. So that's where we see tech, not, you know, uh, robot dogs walking around, but, you know, pretty boring um, computer-based tech at the end of the day, but makes everything more efficient, more predictable, less volatile, and better decisions. Uh, so that's, that's uh, I guess, a lens of text broadly. How is it going to be implemented? I think it's project by project in the near term. In the next 24 months, you know, I don't see massive sea changes on how stuff is done, but a little something is tried new on project A or project B for, for a particular reason. Um, and I think that that growth is slow and steady over time. And I, I do think that most of it will be on administrative and or efficiency-based improvements, as well as data gathering. Excellent, thank you. Um, anybody else want to add on to that? I'm the message I'm hearing is that we're looking at boring tech that gets the job done <laughs> better. Sure. To take it one step further, I think outside of the construction model, we have um, seen a lot of different platforms across our clients on the service delivery model uh, with tenants, um, specifically in the commercial and the residential space. Um, in the multifamily space, especially, we're seeing new technologies being invested in by our clients um, and also you know, utilized on a daily basis for, you know, applications, um, maintenance in units, um, security, where, you know, maybe you don't need the security officer patrolling anymore. You're now, um, you know, engaging a third party who's got facial recognition software to, to securitize your property. So, um, you know, really expanding not only the construction aspect, but also the service delivery on these um, rental properties as well has been a big growth aspect for our clients. Very good, thank you. So I've got one last question for the group. Um, and 
that is that there's a sharpening focus within real estate investment and construction on environmental, social, and governance or ESG factors. Um, so can you comment on what's motivating those changes um, and how ESG factors come into play where infrastructure investment and construction are concerned? I'm happy to, to jump on that one first and then defer to my co-panelists here to, to continue the theme. Where do we see it uh, as being a primary topic? Look, uh, uh, it's in conversations with our clients, both private sector clients and public sector clients. We've saw ESG conversation, um, you know, uh, uh, frankly from Ontario uh, about a decade ago as, as a big component in public procurement um, and is continuing to be a focal point in, in procurement about how to deliver projects in a more sustainable, let, more carbon friendly manner. Um, I think that as we look to the why behind that on the private side, uh, investors often demand uh, increased ESG responsibility. And so I think because investors in, in development or in individual assets demand ESG responsibility for their investment, development community then demands it of the professional service community building those projects. Um, and so you start to see a value chain um, either directly from government as the payer or from the ultimate investors in private sector real estate um, for more of an awareness and an understanding and an engagement around uh, ESG. Uh, the last one I'll point out is I think Bill Gates' new book, which talks a lot about carbon impact you know, globally and the amount uh, that, that uh, steel and concrete contribute to, to pollution, um, you know, continues to bring the vernacular into the mainstream a little more and, and will continue to bring the, the vernacular in, in, of, of the built environment as a carbon source into uh, the limelight and uh, more smart people think about how to reduce it um, uh, across the entire ecosystem. Yeah, I would say our, our clients from an operational perspective are also considering that. And, you know, especially in the solar space, I don't think I've had a client, you know, thus far in operations that hasn't asked me about, you know, solar panels on one of their properties and, and how that can, you know, help both their business and their um, you know, electricity delivery, but also, um, you know, keep that in mind from a, a social perspective as well. Thank you. Tom, anything to add to that? No, I, I agree with all that. I, I would say we've been doing a lot of work um, also in the higher ed space. And I, I think there where you have a lot of student and faculty that feel really strongly about sustainability and carbon neutrality, you're, you're starting to see more and more aggressive goals around um, campus carbon neutrality um, commitments and and with that a focus on um, investing in in sustainable infrastructure um, and and utility uh, systems so I, I think kind of dovetails with with what Sydney and, and Aaron were discussing and and um, yeah no I, th I think that's something that comes up more and more in our projects these days versus five or ten years ago excellent well, with that, I think we're going to wrap this up. Um, it remains to me to thank the panelists, um, uh, Tom, Aaron, and Sydney, one more time. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us today, sharing your, your insights, your expertise, your time for sure. Um, also want to thank uh, Brad Ball of Big Buzz Idea Group who you haven't seen, but who is handling all the production behind the scenes, um, was responsible for the great music, uh, the great cool jazz music at my request that we heard before um, uh, as you were logging in and made everything run uh, very, cl very clockwork. Um, and um, just thank you again for, to the audience for joining us today. Hope you can join us um, at a future event. And Todd, I wanted you to bring you back up and see if you wanted to say a, a, just a couple closing words. Thank you, Zach. Uh, well, thank you to everyone who took time out of your day to join us today. I uh, certainly hope that you found today's program informative and a special thank you to our all-star lineup of panelists. Certainly a lot of terrific, very informative, relevant information was shared today. And certainly thank you very much for sharing your time and, and expertise with us. Uh, with that, I would ask that you would just stay tuned uh, to the Corrosion Illinois Network, uh, where on April 18th, uh, we will present uh, the next webinar entitled Understanding Construction Worker Certifications in the Finishing Trades and Why Certifications Matter. 
So thank you. I look forward to seeing you all down the road and hope everyone stays safe. But again, thank you all for taking time to join us today. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.